In the early 90s, Japan was slowly introduced to the new Game Boy franchise Pokemon, with the original games Red and Green, a trading card game, anime, and much more. But for the rest of the world, the eventual localized franchise hit us all at once like a pocket monster crazed hurricane! I first heard about Pokemon reading a newspaper, for crying out loud. I remember when there were just five officially revealed Pokemon. Like, total. And you bet they were the only thing kids were talking about at school. Gengar, Blastoise, Pikachu, Poliwhirl, and Nidoking. When we found out there were 150 of the puppies, we absolutely went ballistic for every morsel we could get. Believe it or not, the Game Boy was actually struggling for sales at the time, and the new title, Pokemon, was devised as a way to not only entice new customers, but also coax them into convincing their friends to buy, battle, and play, and trade alongside them. Just to be clear that this series was all about money from its very inception. Not to be pessimistic for what's to come, Pokemon was just very different back then. Its gameplay concept was revolutionary and successfully hooked an entire generation with its infectious media sensation. You've got to remember, there was nothing like this at the time. Aside from Shin Megami Tensei. So rather than exploring humble beginnings, we're watching a glorious spectacle obliterate the competition and slowly fall downhill, losing its identity and charm over decades. If Game Freak could fall any farther, they'd technically be in orbit. All right, enough of the low-hanging fruit straight faces now <laughs> oh, this game is so good but it's so good <laughs> So I'm a seven-year-old wee lad, jealous of my friends and cousins playing on their NES and N64 and collecting some of the new Pokemon trading cards and Burger King toys, and we'd watch together as the TV show ended and they'd all whip out their Game Boys and link cables and wonder why I didn't have one. It was a media tidal wave and I was drowning in envy. My parents hated video games, but caved after seeing how much misery I was in being shunned like an Amish boy at a Best Buy because of their stubborn refusal to let me play with this supposed devil in a box. So after some more shameless begging, they finally bought me a purple Game Boy Color bundled with Super Mario Bros. Deluxe from Kmart and my very own copy of Pokemon Blue. Though the first game I ever played was Super Mario Bros. on my cousin's NES, Pokemon Blue was my first personal experience with games. I vividly recall discovering how to navigate a top-down world and find the indoor exits by looking at the floor mats. When a neighbor taught me how to save my game, my mind was blown! That was possible? I could finally make it past Viridian Forest and keep my War Turtle? There's more to this game? Unfortunately, my start button no longer works, and both of those games were later taken and sold to GameStop without my consent, but I do still have my Pokemon Red, which I saved up for and bought with my own money at a Sam's Club. It's funny how you can't remember what you ate, much less even did yesterday, but one 30-year-old Game Boy game got seared into your memory with a branded iron. I was beaten at school and home almost daily, forced to cope and mask my un diagnosed autism, as well as undergo unending physical and psychological abuse for my entire childhood. But goddamn, the one thing I'll never forget for the rest of my life was playing Pokemon for the very first time. Alright, let's talk about chicken fighting monsters and tiny balls. Alright, Monsters to Allies wasn't exactly a new idea, considering Megami Tensei had been doing it for nearly a decade before Pokemon. But even still, as my first RPG, everything felt new and exciting. Let's try to forget everything the series added or adapted later, and instead imagine this little Game Boy game independent from the new mechanics and entire franchise it would later birth. In Pokemon, you capture, train, raise, battle, trade, and collect up to 150 different monsters. The name Pokemon is actually a portmanteau of the original Japanese title, Pocket Monsters, where the idea was to live in a world where you could capture and raise your own monsters that could shrink down inside of balls that fit into your pockets. To individualize your game, your first choice is in deciding which of the three Pokemon offered to you by the local Professor Oak you would like to adopt as your first partner. Immediately, your game will feel unique from your friend's game, and from this point on, what you choose to capture and raise will only personalize your experience further. 
Hunter. Wild Pokemon can be encountered and captured all over the world, but if you intend on hunting down all 150, you'll need the help of a friend, as there are actually two versions of the game itself, red and blue, with unique Pokemon appearing in each. Technically, Japan first played red and green, which you can think of as the beta for the updated blue, which was the version that they ported to the West and re-split into our red and blue to retain the trading incentive functionality. There's also the amalgamated version yellow, designed to capitalize on the anime, allowing you to obtain Ash's full team and be accompanied by a stubborn Pikachu who follows you everywhere and refuses to evolve. Wasn't really ever my thing, but hey, some people have some weird nostalgia boners for this one. Setting itself apart from the rest of the series, you are set off on a journey not to defeat the eight gyms and challenge the Pokemon League, but instead to collect and catalog all 150 Pokemon in your new Pokedex. All that other stuff along the way is secondary, and only exists to slowly corral you through the region like a giant obstacle course. You're given the Pokedex out of tradition in later installments, but in the originals, completing it was the object of the game. Professor Oak's aides would also occasionally meet up with you and evaluate your progress and reward you for hitting new milestones in your decks. Pokemon was a game about exploration, discovery, and collecting. Remember the original tagline, gotta catch them all, was used so frequently because catching them all was the point. With a growing number of Pokemon from here on, future games inevitably had to change the object of the game as catching them all quickly became unfeasible. Now would you believe me if I told you that my love of Metroid actually stemmed from a forgotten aspect of Pokemon Red and Blue? No. Well, anyway, unlike most of the series, Red and Blue allow almost complete freedom to the player, gating them occasionally with obstacles that they need to figure out and organically tackle in almost any order. Well, when you put it like that, the HM system is there to gate your exploration until you've completed some sort of challenge or captured a compatible Pokémon so you can use a new move outside of battle. When you acquire the move Cut, for example, you can suddenly unlock and travel to almost any city in the game and tackle the remaining gyms in whatever order you happen to stumble across them. Capturing and collecting Pokemon for battles was already cool enough, but now your growing collection was also your ticket to unlocking more of the world by pushing boulders, surfing across the sea, and even flying in the skies! This alongside thirsty guards, a local mafia uprising, and a giant sleeping lard ball blocking the road, this game is very hands-off and open to organic discovery. You know, that kinda is just like Metroid. And nothing like most of the other games, but let's not go there. Another reason modern Pokemon games kinda suck is they're about as easy as accidentally talking to the Pokemon Center lady twice because you mashed A through her dialogue because you just wanted your Pokemon back already and she just wouldn't stop from being so freaking polite and now you've healed your entire team twice! So to make a better example of his point, Pokemon are assigned elemental types with weaknesses and resistances that aren't immediately apparent and are intended to be learned through trial and error. And nothing illustrates this more than the game's first gym leader, Brock. Suddenly your Charmander's Ember or your Bulbasaur's Tackle aren't even dent Brock's rock-solid defense, so you are forced backwards to retrain or catch new Pokemon to discover the answer to Brock's challenge. The game unapologetically neglects to explain any of this to you, so that you work hard to overcome its obstacles on your own. Squirtle's Bubble, on the other hand, slaughters Brock, and it's the very next gym leader, Misty, who will give the hard lesson in tight matchups to those who picked the turtle. Here's the entire game loop. You discover and catch new Pokemon and choose to battle with them. Tough battles encourage more collecting and backtracking, which in turn results in the urge to push farther into more difficult battles. And what's your reward for beating all eight gyms and toppling the Pokemon League? Passage into Cerulean Cave, chock full of rare and powerful Pokemon to finish up your collection, culminating in the encounter with number 150 himself, Mewtwo. And this is all on top of managing limited item storage space, not knowing what your new level up attacks even did, considering there kind of isn't really an internet for this yet, and getting ambushed at the worst times by Oak's smug grandson. If you were new to Pokemon, which obviously everybody was when first playing this game, Pokemon was actually hard! But not too hard that a seven-year-old me couldn't beat it several times over. If the target audience was the obvious ten-year-olds, then I guess Game Freak's definition of modern ten-year-olds are now helpless, stupid, incompetent, forgetful, apologetic babies. If you can't see how Fire Red, Leaf Green, or especially Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee aren't evidence of the babyfication of Pokemon, then pause your Coco Melon and spit out your mom's left tit for a minute and play this game. Cause you know what? It's still so good! It's so good!
Most of the original red and green Pokemon sprites look like they were drawn by holding a pen with your foot, but there are some winners in there that actually look better than the updated red and blue sprites. I mean, check out the old Parasect, Gengar, or Dragonite and you'll see what I mean. For the most part, the original 150 Pokemon gained their identity in the redrawn red and blue sprites that better reflect the personality and character of the Ken Sugimori art style. Man, Ken Sugimori used to be my favorite artist as a kid. Look at how much dynamic energy his original watercolor illustrations have when compared to his modern plastic lifeless work. One incredible aspect of these games is that by playing them on a Game Boy Color, the whole world gets tinted in various color palettes reflecting the area's literal hues like Cerulean, Fuchsia, and Lavender Towns. The Pokemon themselves also get unique colorized overhauls and it looks incredible! Now if you're playing the made-for-color Pokemon Yellow, the Pokemon sprites and game world got overhauled again to reflect the style of the anime. Though they lose some of their quirky charm, many sprites got an undeniable glow up if you can tolerate the overly saturated color burn in your eyes. Hey, the Game Boy Color wasn't exactly backlit, so you had to strain your eyes and cock it at the perfect angle so you could even see what you were doing while avoiding a glare. Take your cell phone outside on a sunny day, drop your brightness down as low as it can go, and try to play Tetris or something and you'll begin to grasp what portable gaming was like in the 90s. In Pokemon, you play as Red, a 10-year-old kid setting off on a solo expedition to the greater world because the senile scientist next door asked you to complete his life's work by cataloging every single species of the wild, tameable Pokemon. Professor Oak claims that this was his life's work, but when you pick up where he left off, his Pokedex is completely empty, and the three Pokemon he has to his name can't be found anywhere in the entire world. Professor Sketchy's bratty grandson, whose name he completely forgets but gets canonized as Blue, butts in and sets off on his own adventure to topple the Pokemon League and become the strongest trainer in the world. He intentionally chooses a starter Pokemon who is strong against your own and will berate and insult you throughout the game even when you demolish him in battle. Blue is a dick. He's always mocking you while staying one step ahead and always lighting a fire under your butt, tempting you to show him who's boss and beat him to the Pokemon League. Man, modern Pokemon rivals just don't get it. Blue is an egotistical douchebag, and you want to get that cathartic rush of watching him fail against you. You work so hard, not because he's your bestest buddy and by the power of friendship you could do anything, but because you want to stomp on his hopes and dreams of becoming the new reigning champion and send him crying back to grandpa. So along the way you topple a mafia crime syndicate intent on abusing Pokemon for profit, exercising the raging spirit of a dead Marowak, and help an old sailor man vomit into a bucket. And once you defeat the Pokemon League, you realize Blue actually beat you to it and just became the new champion. So you clash for the title and rob him of his dream right in front of his grandfather. We didn't do all this out of maintaining some moral high ground or enacting a noble quest or anything. No, we just left home to dogfight some wild animals, take a cruise, go on a safari, topple a crime lord, and shatter the boy next door's entire life aspirations, all because he's a pompous butt pimple and you just want to watch that pus fly when you finally give him a good squeeze. You're 10 years old. As much of a clown Junichi Masuda is, he knocked it out of the park on Game Boy. I already love the sounds of this system, but the way this puppy sings when you're playing Pokemon is like nothing else. You know the best part of the original anime is listening to the orchestrated remade Game Boy soundtrack in the background? Considering the rest is half campy creative liberties and half painful puns, absolutely. Each of the Pokemon also get unique cries when initiating battle. Though they basically sound like a dial-up mode and passing gas, these sounds helped contribute to the monster's personality. So much so that Game Freak refused to update or change them for nearly 15 years. Route 3 and Cinnabar Island still soothe my nerves. Lavender Town and Pokemon Tower still send a chill up my spine. And darn it, if the gym leader and champion themes aren't the best battle tracks in the series, then pack up and take your balls someplace else, because we're not friends anymore. 2016's Pokemon Go was a sensation, not because it was a mobile game with Pokemon, but because it was a return to form with monster collecting and player community taking the forefront as the object of the game, shifting back to the original formula established in Generation 1. The glitches in this game are amazing. 
With the right knowledge, you can manipulate nearly any Pokémon you want to appear in the wild, including the event-exclusive number 151, Mew. Even as a kid, I had tons of fun in post-games surfing up and down the east shore of Cinnabar in hopes of finding the playground fabled Missing No, or capturing an absurdly juiced-up beast like my level 149 Alakazam. Though if you ever used him in battle, he'd instantly level down to the corrected level 100. So only being good for one insanely OP psychic, I appropriately named him the Spank! If you're interested in hearing our opinions on all of Kanto's Pokémon, then check out the whole video where we snicker about Silly Monsters, shameless plug. There's also an entire Let's Play we did of Randomized Pokémon Red, which you could also go check out on your own if you like corny old videos of mine, shameless plug. Pokémon Red and Blue were an unmatched social experiment with an addictive positive feedback loop of collecting, battling, and shared personal experiences. My parents thought they were soiling my mind, turning me into an isolated, heathenistic couch potato, but in the end, Pokemon became a conduit for my obsession. It taught me the strength of cooperation, and actively encouraged me to quell my fears and give other people a chance. Oh, and uh, Super Mario Bros. Deluxe? It, it was fun too. The positive gamer in me has no doubt about Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow capturing a feisty 9 out of 10. If there's any game I'm unabashedly guilty of calling my happy place game, it's this precious 373 kilobyte brick of endearing, janky goodness. The critical gamer in me appraises the breakout Pokemon Generation 1 with a well-earned 8 out of 10. Though Pokemon will slowly swap its big boy shorts for some pampered pull-ups, at least when going back to those old shorts, they're still undeniably comfy and easy to wear. But what do you think? Let us know how your positive and uh, critical sides rate Pokemon Generation 1 in the comments below. I do hope this video helps shed some light on why Pokemon Generation 1 is so special to so many people. But if you're intent on canceling genuine fans with a toxic refusal to appreciate something they love, well, smell you later. Cause you're just playing with yourself. Of course, after how many years I finally update my banner and I remove my, my Pokemon fleece blanket from red and blue when it was finally relevant, like it just missed its chance for glory. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to like and subscribe for more, and use the links in the description to nominate your own episode. And thank you all to our Patreon members, Arrow, Aspen, Genio, Lura, and Squad Fam. Boop.